Yesterday we talked about collision oh, cars, right? Was, so I have a red collision car and a blue collision car. I know you can kind of see them because the camera's in the way. All right, George, you have the, the, the worst view. All right. But when the collision cars collide, okay, when the collision cars collide, <laughs> what do you know what the force one exerts on the other? Okay, so these two collision cars have exactly the same mass, right? Uh -huh. Right? No, I just realized I'm like blocking you out. I'm sorry. Can you, can you see it all right? Okay. Is that better? You're freaking podium. Okay, can I want to go sit by Michael? I'll get you guys confused the whole rest of the hour. Okay, so I have these two collision cars, they hit. We know the force they exert on each other is equal and opposite. Equal and opposite. Good. All right. Solution, real quick. Better? No. Okay. So, what if I take and I add, oh, and I add some mass to the red car? Okay. So now the red car has a bigger mass, right? Yeah. Okay. What can we say about the about the force exerted now? Well, then why does the blue car go away so fast? There's more mass. The red car has more momentum. Okay. Here, let's. Let's take another situation. Last, last time I really like, like this situation. I take these two and I push them as much as I can together. Their magnets are repelling each other, right? Mm -hmm. What do we know about the force exerted on the two? It's equal. It's equal. Newton's third law, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. As the magnets push equally on each other. All right. Now I'm gonna take my hand off both cars. If they're experiencing the same force, why does the blue car have a bigger acceleration? It has less mass. Good. It has less mass. Okay. So even though the, the velocities might make you think one experiences a bigger force, the masses play a role in the velocities they leave with, right? Right? So the forces that so even in this case, when the two cars run into each other, the forces they apply to each other is equal and opposite in direction. Right? Does that make sense? So blue car experiences the blue car applies a force this way to the red car which is equal and opposite to the force of the red car and the blue car, which is that way. Right? We good? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, it's being kind of redundant for, the, for you guys, but that's all right. All right. So if I have two collision cars, If I have two collision cars that are colliding with each other, we'll call this collision car one and this one collision car two. Okay? What's which way is the force of one on two? Which way is the force of one on two? Which way do you say? To the right. Thank you, Rex. So one applies a force to two going that way, right? Right? Yeah. Which way does two apply a force to one? Left. Left. So here's the force of two, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, what do we know about those forces again? Okay. So F one equals F two, right? But two is in the negative. It's in the opposite direction. Okay. That doesn't make sense. All right, so force one equals force two, but they're, they're opposite directions. Right? Newton's third law. Now, how does the time of the collision compare for the two cars? How does the time of the collision compare? Same. It's the same. So I can multiply both sides by the same equation, and we get this, right? Right? And this is known as? Impulse. So this right here is this the impulse on one or the impulse on two? Follow me, pay attention. This is the impulse on one or the impulse on two? One. Two. Two. Because two experiences a force from one, right? Yeah. And this one is the impulse on one. one. Okay. Now, the reason why we had to switch numbers there, or switch the subscripts, is because 2 experiences an impulse to the right. 
Right. It's in the same direction as the force, right? And one experiences an impulse to the left, left. left in the same direction with force. Okay. And those impulses are also equal and opposite. Does that make sense? Okay. Now from here we can extend our thinking. We'll get there. We can extend our thinking to this, right? Change in momentum for 2 equals a change in momentum for 1. Does that make sense? This is something we talked about a little bit yesterday, right? Right? Okay. When we were talking about that yesterday, we did this problem. For example, 11. You guys use the change in momentum to figure it out. Okay? You may have finished, you may not have finished. Looking at this from the change in momentum and starting with delta P2 equals delta P equals negative delta P1, I think is confusing. Okay? So I'm going to show you a different approach besides the one we did yesterday. Okay? This, this different approach starts with delta P2 equals negative delta P1. So in this problem, a 5 kilogram collision, 0.5 kilogram collision car is traveling at 1.3 meters per second west when it collides with a 1 kilogram collision car traveling 0.9 meters per second east. After the collision, 0.5 kilogram collision car has a velocity of 0.3 meters per second east. What's the velocity of the other car, the 1 kilogram car? So we're trying to figure this out. Now, it doesn't matter which car I call car 1 and car 2 up here. Okay? It doesn't matter which car I call car 1 and car 2, which mass or whatever. But the, the situation is still the same, right? The forces they exert each other is equal. The time of the collisions are equal. The impulses are equal and opposite. Their change in momentum are equal and opposite, right? Now, the hang up with this method is this negative sign. It often gets forgotten or it confuses us. So, when we're actually doing our algebra, that negative sign confuses us a little bit, all right? It makes us make mistakes that we don't need to. So, we're going to try to make an easier way to solve this problem, okay? And that easier way starts by expanding these out. Change in momentum. So I have delta P2 equals negative delta P1, right? Right? Change in momentum, isn't it? So this is the mass of 2 times velocity final minus the mass of 2 times velocity initial, right? Right, isn't this the approach we took yesterday? And this equals the negative mass of 1, v final, minus mass of 1, v initial. Now, whenever we have parentheses, what should we do with that first? Get rid of them, right? So how do I get rid of those parentheses? Distribute what? The negative sign. So when I distribute the negative... We get M1V final negative plus M1V initial. And that equals M2V final minus M2V initial. Whoa. Okay. Does that make sense? Now, I don't know about you guys, but I hate working with negative signs. I mess them up. I don't know if I got to count the velocity negative again or not. Okay? It, I always get screwed up with my negative signs sometimes. All right? So let's get rid of our negative signs. Would you guys agree you don't like negative signs? Yes. yes. Yeah. Did I count the force? Did I not count the force? Did I count the direction? Did I not count the direction? It, it, it gets confusing. Right? So let's get rid of our negative signs. So how do I get rid of this negative sign? Plus. Plus it. We add it, right? So we move this to that side, don't I? So we add M to V initial. Add M to V initial. How do we get rid of that negative sign? Plus. Add M1 V final. We add M1 V final. So what happens is this cancels and this cancels, and we are left with this. That's an interesting equation. All of our F's are on one side, all of our I's are on the other. 
right? So this one represents the, the momentum when? The final. The final momentum, right? The final momentum in one car or both cars? Both. This is the final momentum of the whole system after the collision, right? This is the momentum of the whole system before. So what this shows us is that the total momentum after the collision equals the total momentum Before well, we already knew that. the collision. You already knew that. How'd you know that? Just thought it made sense. Just thought it made sense. Okay. We did we have talked a little bit about this in previous discussions. Okay, we kind of referenced it a little bit, but we haven't like, put it to paper yet. Right? So this non. You said what or was it waiting? You were to ask what COM stands for. Non? This is COM. What do you think the C stands for? Nope. Something before equals something after. Like the energy thing we just did. Conservation of momentum. momentum. Okay. So what this is, what COM stands for is conservation of momentum. Okay. So for short, it's called COM. What conservation of momentum tells us is that in a closed system, what's a closed system? No friction, no, no outside forces, right? So in a closed system, it's a system with no outside forces. Momentum is conserved. So in a closed system, momentum is Conserved. So in a closed system, momentum is conserved. Not, not a fish sponsor. I wish. Can I just get some free stuff? All right. So, in a closed system, momentum is conserved. Is this a closed system right here? From the moment I let go of the car, is this a closed system? No. It's close, right? There is some friction acting, but it's close to a closed system, right? Okay. The reason I know it's a closed system comes from a problem like this. All right, so I'm going to take the red car and I'm going to push it towards the blue car. How's, the, how's the, the velocity of the blue car after the collision compared to the velocity of the red car before the collision? It's the same. The same. These two have exactly the same mass, right? So the momentum of the red car before the collision, we could say it's arbitrarily 5. When it collides with the blue car, it transfers that momentum to the blue car. Now the red car is stationary and the blue car is moving. Okay? Now, a clever student once asked, if momentum is conserved, then how does the red car have momentum before the collision, but none after? How does the red car have a momentum of five before, but zero after? That's not conserving, right? I go from five to zero, I lost momentum, didn't I? Potential momentum. No, nope, there's no such thing as potential momentum. Okay. So, when we're looking at momentum, conserving momentum, are we just looking at one car? No. Are we just looking at one aspect of the system? No. We have to look at everything. Okay? Momentum is conserved in this case because if the red car has five before, when it hits the blue car and comes to a stop, and the blue car goes off with the same velocity, the blue car now has five, right? So before, we had five for the red, zero for the blue. What's the total? Five. After, we have five for the blue, zero for the red. What's the total? Five. Is momentum conserved? Yes. yes. 
The same student then said to me, well, what if we take the blue car, add some mass to it, push it towards the red car? Why does the red car go away at such a bigger velocity? Good. Smaller mass. Okay? Conservation momentum is not just velocities. It's the product of mass and velocity. So the blue car, right now this blue car, has twice the mass of this red car. Right? So if they collide and the blue car comes to a stop, the red car should have twice the... Nope. Twice the velocity, because they have the same momentum, right? This car has a mass. This car has a mass of two and a velocity of two. What's the momentum? Two times two is four. When it collides with the red car, which has a mass of one, what will its final velocity have to be? I need to equal four, right? One times four equals four. Right? So in order for this to conserve momentum, the lighter car has to have a greater velocity. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So even though it looks like thing, momentum might not be, be conserved, okay, until you actually look at the numbers, mass times velocity, right? you can't actually determine if it's conserved or not. Hey, gentlemen, put your homework away. We're not doing that right now. Okay? Well, Jose, get your, foot, get your foot down. Thank you. Any questions? So when we're talking about conservation momentum, do I just focus on one object or all the objects? All the objects. Okay. So conservation momentum. When it says in a closed system momentum is conserved, what that means is that the sum of the momentum before, sum of momentum initial equals the sum of momentum final. Okay. So those that are pre-calc are probably saying, oh, we're not doing sums, are we? We're not adding up from 1 to 7. No, we're not doing that. Okay. The sigma is just used to say that the momentum 1 of object 1 plus momentum of object 2 plus, keep going, equals momentum of object 1 after, oops, should put initials, initials, final, final, and keeps going. So they're the same. So it just, it just reminds us that we need to consider all of the momentums. Okay. Now, I can take this one step further. In this class, we'll probably we'll most often use only two objects in our system. Okay. We might start with one and end with two. We might start with two and end with one. Then things collide and stick together. All right. But we will most often use systems with only two objects. Right. So I can rewrite this like this. M1 V initial plus M1 V prime or sorry, not get ahead of myself. Plus M2 V initial equals M1 V final plus M2 V final. Okay. And that right there is our equation for conservation momentum. Yes, guys. That's fine. Does that make sense, guys? Does that equation make sense? Okay. Now, why don't I have initial masses and final masses? Because the mass should be the same. Okay, because the mass should be the same. The mass should stay the same. Only velocities are changing. All right? And this is the, the initial velocity of mass 1, initial velocity of mass 2, final velocity of mass 1, final velocity of mass 2. Right? So I could add more subscripts. And the 1s and 2s are just subscripts. They're not multiplied. I don't do m times 2 times v. It's a subscript. It helps us keep track of the mass. Right? Sometimes subscripts can be confusing. I know. All right. Any questions? All right. One more demonstration of conservation momentum. I'm going to use Newton's cradle. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, that's kind of trippy right there. If you don't, if you don't, yeah, if you don't give called Newton's. You don't give possession. You just say Newton's ball. No, it's Newton's cradle is the correct. If you give Rex, drop it. I'm going to laugh when you accidentally say it. I know. Okay. So here's Newton's cradle. All right. So you can see if we're up there, that's fine. You can see the top view. Either way. It's kind of bugging me. It's not too bad. Okay. We good? All right. 
Now I'm going to pull one sphere back. I'm going to release it. Okay, one orb. Okay. Now when I release it, what's going to happen? Okay. Only one ball is ejected from the other side, right? So why is it only firing off one? We're moving a little bit. Okay. Okay, conservation momentum. We're conserving momentum. Kyle, stop playing around, folks. Okay. We're conserving momentum. All right. The velocity of the the one that the one comes in with is equal to the velocity that the other one leaves with. Okay. Kind of cool. Right. Pull it way back. Always mm -hmm. have the velocity. Mm -hmm. And a bigger velocity. Okay. Right? Kind of cool. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, what would happen if I pull two back? Uh, two. Then two on the other side. Two? Yeah. What if just one went? What if it did? Wouldn't Halo have less? Not the same. We'd have more velocity. So, two get ejected now, right? Because we're still conserving momentum, right? Now, if only one ball was ejected, right, then it would have a greater velocity than the two came in with. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Let's try four. I'm going to swing four. Now, is this one, is it going to go flying away? Maybe? Okay. Okay. Still four, right? Because it's conserving momentum. Okay. Now, it is possible to conserve momentum and not have one fly away. If I taped all four of those together and had a swing and hit the other one, the other one would fly away with, with a much greater velocity. Okay. Now, is this a closed system? No. No. Okay. There is air resistance. So eventually, they slow down. Okay. I did all five, it looks like it's dead. Okay. Here's another cool one. Two and one. I did that. Okay? Okay, so Caleb, if you've done this, then don't, don't, don't rule it in front of me, okay? How is two and one going to end up? It's gonna, the two is going to go on the left, and it's going to be one on the right. Okay. So the side that has two to start, how many balls will be ejected? One. One. The side that has one, how many will be ejected? Two. Now the trick here is I gotta release them from the same height at the same time. Okay. So we're conserving momentum, right? The side that had two has a momentum of two coming towards the, towards the center, right? Yeah. The side that has one has a momentum of one going towards the center, right? Those momentums don't change after the collision. We conserve momentum, right? Now the total momentum is still one to the right. The one that way, right? All right. So the momentum doesn't change. We still have momentum of one going this way and two going that way after the collision. Does that make sense, guys? Yes. Does that make sense? So Newton's cradle is kind of a cool way to observe momentum conservation. What do you think? On each side, what do you think? Okay. Just momentum. So. Anyone else? Did you? You guys made it? Wow, that's kind of cool. You're afraid to drop one of them. Now, it takes it takes some care when you when you construct these because they have to be hanging so their centers of masses hit each other. If they don't hit the center of mass, then the forces are in a straight line. You can bounce them bounce the the objects all over the place. All right. All right. Any questions? Any questions about conservation momentum? Anybody? No? Oh.